While I was doing research for my next video on that other really popular HBO drama, I stumbled across a post on Reddit that completely distracted me. It was a video of director David Sandberg going over the mistakes in his own movie, Shazam. A basic rundown of the video is David explaining how each scene of a movie has challenges that exist outside of written materials such as pacing or plot points. For example, sometimes you have camera crew awkwardly standing in your shot so you need to turn them into shoppers that, for some reason, don't react at all to a man flying just feet in front of them. Or how sometimes you need to have your main cast strangely wear winter coats indoors because the villain shows up and there wouldn't be an opportunity for them to change later. I guess there's no such thing as a coat rack in this house. There was another section, though, when David Sandberg talked about the character of Darla and the difficulty surrounding one of her scenes. The actress Faith C. Herman wasn't able to make it on set with her other co-stars on a particular day due to scheduling issues, so David chose to film her separately on another day. To justify the separation in-universe, Darla is shown to be ridiculously slow at putting on her Velcro shoes, therefore keeping her from being outside with the rest of the cast. Quick easy fix, right? Well, this little tidbit by David Sandberg is where things get really interesting. But working with movies has kind of ruined video essays and film analysis a little bit for me because you just never know if something was part of a brilliant plan or if it just happened to turn out that way because a problem had to be solved on the day. In Shazam, Darla has a clearly defined arc. Early on, we see her being the slowest of the foster kids, which is, of course, the setup to the payoff of her getting super speed powers later on. Yeah. 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 Yes. What David Sandberg addressed was the phenomenon of people inserting symbolism into a piece of fiction that the creative source did not intend to be there. Nowhere in David's mind or in the script was there meant to be a narrative arc built up around Darla starting out slow and then gaining immense speed. But does the lack of intent on David Sandberg's part actually make Darla's storyline any less symbolic? If the audience perceives symbolism, does it come to exist? These questions and the overarching topic surrounding it gave me the perfect excuse to put the Chernobyl video on the back burner and dive into a subject I had been wanting to talk about for a while now. Internal validity in fiction. I know, not the sexy topic that you thought we'd be getting into, but trust me, you might actually like where this is going. Internal validity in fiction references how well the fictional material does it accurately telling you about itself. To make things more simple, let me give an example. A fictional work that demonstrates low internal validity is Ant-Man. In the beginning of the movie, we are told that the technology that powers Ant-Man's suit allows him to shrink while still maintaining the same density and weight as if he were regular size. When I took over this company for Dr. Pym, I immediately started researching a particle that could change the distance between atoms while increasing density and strength. So you have the force of a 200 pound man behind a fist a hundredth of an inch wide, you're like a bullet. However, later in the movie, we see Scott Lang running on a pistol and riding an ant, even though he's supposed to weigh as much as a fully grown man. The reason why Ant-Man has low internal validity is because the movie does not give reliable information on itself. What the fiction tells the audience does not match with what the fiction shows the audience. Now, you savvy writers out there may recognize that this all sounds a lot like internal consistency, which is where the rules within the fictional work continue to exist and function as they did previously, unless otherwise indicated. And you savvy writers would be correct. Internal consistency falls under the umbrella term of internal validity. But the difference between the two is that where internal consistency is mainly concerned with understanding the rules of a fiction, internal validity is concerned with understanding all facets of a fiction. And to get what I mean by that, I feel that another explanation is in order, and we can look to our friend that keeps on giving, Game of Thrones. In Season 3, Episode 7, when Tywin and Joffrey share the throne room, they have a conversation that gives the audience information about dragons and the history of Westeros. When I was Hand of the King under your father's predecessor, the skulls of all the Targaryen dragons were kept in this room. The skull of the last of them was right here. It was the size of an apple. And the biggest was the size of a carriage. Yes, 
and the creature to whom it belonged died 300 years ago. So, we know from multiple sources that the largest dragon was Beleriand the Black Dread. In the books which the show was based off of, Beleriand was used to take over Westeros 300 years prior to the events of Game of Thrones, lining up pretty nicely with what Tywin said. And the creature to whom it belonged died 300 years ago. Except in the books, Beleriand didn't die 300 years ago. In fact, he lived almost 100 years after the Targaryens took over Westeros. But as George R. R. Martin says, the show is the show and the books are the books. There are many differences between the world that the show establishes and the one that the books do. Beleriand's age and death is just one more. Except when you consider internal validity, things become a lot less simple. In Season 2, Episode 6, where Tywin is unknowingly talking to Arya, we get this little gem from him. Aegon Targaryen changed the rules. That's why every child alive still knows his name, 300 years after his death. It wasn't just Aegon riding his dragon. It was Rainey's and Visenya too. Correct. Student of history, are you? Rainey's rode Miraxis. Visenya rode Vega. I'm sure I knew that when I was a boy. Here we have Tywin admitting that he did not know fundamental details about the founding members of Westeros. His knowledge of the history of dragons and House Targaryen is a bit lacking. So, since internal validity references how well a fictional material doesn't accurately tell you about itself, we are presented with a bit of a problem concerning Beleriand and therefore the history of Westeros. Do we believe Tywin's statement in the throne room, which stands in opposition to the source material, or do we assume Tywin is misinformed because of what we saw of him in Season 2, leaving room for the source material to still be correct? There is not a clear-cut answer for this, but either way, this example shows us the far-reaching implications of internal validity. A 94-year period of world history is left in limbo because the method the show used to convey information about itself was unreliable. Tywin has low internal validity. And because of this uncertainty, we of the audience have to come to our own conclusion and find answers in the patterns that we see in the fiction. This becomes especially difficult when concerning animation. Do you ever wonder why we're always, like, wearing gloves? That's a really good question. Internal validity causes us to think about the truth that the fiction is presenting us, and how it relates to everything else within the fiction. If all the characters are wearing gloves, do they recognize it? Do they coordinate about it beforehand? Is Bobby Zemiruski the first person to realize it? Watching an extremely goofy movie with internal validity in mind might make the audience turn this innocuous statement about gloves into a question of groupthink, free will, and whether or not these characters are self-reflective of their own circumstances. Of course, in reality, we know that all the characters wearing gloves was just an efficient, stylistic choice because the artists have told us as much. Characters were, in black and white films, difficult to see against their black bodies. Walt Disney addresses this very issue. He says, we didn't want him to have mouse hands because he was supposed to be more human. So we gave him gloves. So in addition to saving time and providing color contrast, gloves bring non-human things to life, making their grand gestures stand out. But a lot of the time, we as the audience don't get such a background on what appears in a fiction, and we are left to our own devices to decipher what the fiction presents to us. This has most famously occurred with Pixar movies across a wide variety of subjects. Things as mundane as the mountains in the film Cars, which are literally shaped like automobiles, have left people wondering if the cars sculpted these mountains in their image, and if so, how? And if not, did the landscape naturally learn to match the life that inhabits it? On the flip side, you have the complexity of the Pixar theory, an argument that all Pixar movies take place in one timeline because fans started noticing how the films shared objects and circumstances. But it's not just Pixar. Interpretations of internal validity have affected audiences across multiple fictional platforms. Fans of Avatar The Last Airbender have hypothesized that the show's world is smaller than Earth's with lower gravity because of how the characters are able to be blasted through buildings and thrown dozens of feet with no serious injuries. Fans of Pokemon have tried to parse out how Macargo can exist when its Pokedex entry says it's almost twice as hot as the Earth's core. Internal validity has caused the Lord of the Rings fanbase to grapple with the fact that orcs may or may not dine at restaurants with menus. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys! Considerations of internal validity become almost impossible to ignore when truly invested in a piece of fiction. 
investigating what a fiction states about itself and how accurate those statements are is a fundamental way of learning about not only the fiction, but the message that it is trying to present. Fortunately, fictions quite often have a thesis statement at their beginnings and end so that we as the audience don't have to do too much digging for meaning. With great power comes great responsibility. I will never forget these words. With great power comes great responsibility. Conversely though, some fictions never outright come forward with their message, demanding the audience consider internal validity to decipher what the fiction is actually saying about itself. Allegorical movies like The Babadook and Mother don't give you the answers to what they are truly about, so it's incumbent on the viewer to unpack the symbolism on their own. But this is the difficulty that comes with internal validity, a concept built upon scrutinizing a fiction against itself. There is no clear-cut line for audiences to know which fiction gives its message away and which fiction begs the audience to find it. And because of this blurry duality, people sometimes see meaning in patterns and symbolism in places where they were never planned to be. This is what David Sandberg was talking about with Darla and the interpreted symbolism of her story arc. And other creators have voiced their opinion on fans seeing unintended symbolism. Or rather, I should say, they have written their opinions down. When award-winning author Bruce McAllister was 16 years old, he sent out questionnaires to accomplished writers. One of the questions included, do readers ever infer that there is symbolism in your writing where you had not intended it to be? If so, what is your feeling about this type of inference? And believe it or not, teenage Bruce McAllister actually got responses. Ray Bradbury responded to him by writing, One critic thought my vampire family story Homecoming was intended as a parable on mankind in the atomic age, under the threat of the atom bomb. I was mostly amused. After all, each story is a Rorschach test, isn't it? And if people find beasties and bedbugs in my ink splotches, I cannot prevent it, can I? They will insist on seeing them anyway, and that is their privilege. Still, I wish people, quasi-intellectuals, did not try so hard to find the man under the old maid's bed. More often than not, as we know, he simply isn't there. Another response given to Bruce McAllister was from Pulitzer and Nobel Prize winner Saul Bellow. When asked if readers infer symbolism that is not intended, he said, They most certainly do. Symbol hunting is absurd. But I think the best response to Bruce McAllister's question came from Joseph Heller, who you might know as the author of Catch-22. When asked about readers inferring symbolism that is not intended, he said, This happens often, and in every case, there is good reason for the inference. In many cases, I've been able to learn something about my own book, for readers have seen much in the book that is there, although I was not aware of it being there. Joseph Heller's answer honestly almost requires a double take. Not only is he saying that it is good that the audience creates symbolism on their own, he is saying that he learns things about his book from other people. How is that even possible? Well, I think it's because Heller thinks very similarly to philosopher and writer Roland Barth, who believed that writings and fiction could exist in such a way that the audience becomes part of the creative process. But before you get ahead of yourself, Barth wasn't talking about stuff like fan fiction. He meant that the audience would take an active role in the construction of meaning within the fiction. The audience could create subjective interpretations of the fiction regardless of what the creator intended, because that is what symbolism is. Symbols, by their very definition, have no intrinsic meaning. We place meaning on them, and the meaning can change from person to person and culture to culture. The OK gesture means one thing in America, but something very different in Europe. Same thing for the middle finger in America versus Japan. Roland Barthes once said, The birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author. Barth wasn't advocating for killing writers. He was advocating that writers relinquish their authority over what can or cannot be in fiction, what interpretations are wrong or right, and allow subjectivity to flourish, which would give the audience the opportunity to actively engage with the fiction rather than passively watch it from behind a transparent divider. Joseph Heller believed that he could learn things about his own fiction from others because every individual experiences and interprets meaning in a unique way. Writers get to choose what appears in a fiction, not the meaning behind what appears. A truly engaging, living, fluid fiction is one where no person can tell you the right way to understand it, creator or fan. We can choose to agree about our interpretations or even disagree, but no matter how many people are on your side or against you, your interpretation is your own. If you want to believe that Hal from Malcolm in the Middle is actually Walt from Breaking Bad in Witness Protection, that's your prerogative. 
Are you right? No. Are you wrong? No. Because that is the point. Your experience with fiction is unique to you, regardless of correct or incorrect. Was Darla's story arc in Shazam meant to be symbolic? No. Can it be interpreted that way? Well, that's up to you. Thank you all for watching, and for anyone who didn't hear my announcement, I opened myself up to do editing. If you have a short story or a novel that you want edited, or you want guidance and coaching on writing, feel free to contact me through email. I offer stuff like developmental edits, where I work alongside you chapter by chapter, novel critiques, concept development, first impression edits, and as I said before, coaching opportunities. And if you're worried about pricing, you can probably relax. I want to make things as affordable as possible for you guys. If you are interested, email me with your genre, word count, and name to get more information. As always, it was a pleasure, and I will talk to you all again soon.